Well, good morning, everybody. Will you stand as we just begin this time of worship uh, with a reminder of who Jesus is and the fact that he is no longer hanging on a cross. He lives and we celebrate his resurrection. You may be seated. That's not our right next song. Anyway, just so you know. Um, we're, for those, there's several of you who are guests with us today. And uh, Aunt Kathy, you have a glow on your face because you are surrounded by your crew. And uh, in the midst of your grief, um, there's a joy. And so, uh, we have been focusing on elements of worship and uh, by no means in a four-week series can we cover all of those elements but in the book of acts the second chapter you see the church gathered together and it says and they devoted themselves to the apostles doctrine to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer and when we gather for sunday morning worship there's a lot of time that's what we are doing we are focusing on God's word. 
We have this time of fellowship, and that's the joy of the church. There's a fellowship together. There's gonna be time for communion, the breaking of bread, and uh, today we're gonna focus on this element of prayer. There's so much that could be said about prayer, and uh, but yet we're gonna try in a one worship service, just kinda hit on a couple of points. Not all points, but just a couple of points. And so the songs we're gonna sing today are just kinda prayers. And so if you could use them, if there's a moment in one of the songs that you just wanna just pause and pray, we have a prayer list in our bulletin. There's a lot of things. Little Leo um, needs to be added to that list. He's in the hospital um, again. And uh, a family is here who is grieving. There's, there's surgeries, there's all kinds of things going on around us. And so, as we did last week using our songs as an opportunity to focus on communion, maybe this week you can just focus on prayer and let these songs be a prayer that you can lift up.
part of our prayer is acknowledging how great God is, but also a part of prayer is the humbling ourselves and coming before him and saying, Lord, I got to have my heart pure first. And so a time of confession and a time of humility is a part of prayer as well. For you, that you are the Redeemer, you are our Savior, you are our Lord, you are our comfort, you are, com you are God of compassion. Father, in all of these things, we are just humbled by who you are. But Father, you also um, are loving in that you are concerned with what goes on in our lives. And so 
We just lift before you those that are on our prayer concern list. And Father, whether it's grief or whether it's illnesses or whether it's um, surgeries and surgery recoveries or just just life in general as we deal with it, Father, thank you that uh, we can come before you and uh, just humble ourselves before you. Father, thanks for these reminders every once in a while that we are not in control of our life, but that doesn't mean that you are not in control. And so we just indeed humbly come before you saying, we need you. We need to hear your answers to our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay. Very good. <laughs> the story of two brothers that farmed together, and they had farmed together for printer at 40 years. And they had become very successful. They lived across the hill from each other. There was kind of a nice pasture with a big pond, and they could look at each other and see what was going on. But one day they uh, went up to the machine shed and they were trying to decide which farm they were going to spray. And the uh, older brother says, let's go spray mine. It needs it worse than yours. And the younger brother said, no. My water hemp is bigger than yours. We need to spray mine. If you don't know what water hemp, it's the big weed in my fields that's standing about <laughs> six foot tall. <laughs> and they really got into it. And it ended up, the older brother's beans got sprayed first, and the younger brother stormed off and said, I'm never going to talk to you again. This is not acceptable. And this went on for a couple months. And then one day, the older brother looked out, and here was an excavator tearing the dam out, and here comes the water, and there was a creek coming between them. So they couldn't walk between the, the two different farms. They were really split. And the older brother says, boy, you know, what's going on here? But a couple days later, uh, a carpenter showed up at his house and said, I've got tools and things I can use. Have you got a job for me? And the older brother said, <clears throat> I've got a job for you job for you. I'm going to have you build a wall eight foot tall so don't I, I don't have to look at my younger brother ever again. I want that wall built sturdy. I don't want to ever see him again. And this, you know, after they farmed together for 40 years. So the brother says, I've got to go to town. Here's the materials. i got a post hole digger, boards. I want you to build me a sturdy wall. And so the older brother left and went to town. And when he came back, he was amazed. Instead of a wall, here was a bridge over the creek. And here was his brother coming running up this bridge and said, my gosh, a brother, an older brother that would do this for me in spite of everything we've done, you know, how great a brother is that? And the older brother stood amazed and says, you know, wow. How can, how can I repay you? In this story, who are you? Are you the older brother, the younger brother? Have you done something that made somebody mad and put up a wall? Or are you the one that would go out and be spite somebody and tear out the dam and make a division between people? Or are you the carpenter that would build the bridge? In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. I think Jesus was the carpenter in the story. He's the one that builds bridges between us and God. He's the one that covers over our sins and says, yes, this person, I want to bring him on. He builds a bridge. So this morning as we take communion, let us all become bridge builders to each other and to God. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come together, let us each of us just look back at our lives and, you know, realize probably each one of us has been a damn terror outer or a wall builder. But this morning we come together and all become bridge builders. We thank Jesus that was the bridge builder between us and God. And he came to earth and realized exactly what was needed to be done. And he followed through. All this we do in Jesus' name.
Amen.
May we bow? Dear Heavenly Father, we're just grateful to be here today in a country that allows us to uh, worship freely with a loving God as you that has uh, blessed us more than what we deserve. You take care of us. You're always in control. Um, please receive these gifts. Bless the gift and the giver that we may further your kingdom in this community and around the world. And forgive us when we fail. In that name we pray. Amen. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids for mustard seeds right now. And for those of your guests, that's for third grade and down. And uh, Monica is ready to go. So as they are leaving, let's watch this video. It's a story uh, that was on CBN Network uh, about our guest, who is going to be our Dwayne and next Peggy week. King had a full so and this. happy life. Married since 1961. They've spent most of their time traveling and sharing the gospel as the founders of Deaf Missions. But in early 2010, Dwayne noticed that something seemed off with Peggy. The terrible, terrible faraway look in her eyes and the actions were just awful. He would tell me that she had some extreme fits of rage if she didn't get her way, and that was not like my mom at all. She's one of the sweetest ladies on the planet. She just didn't have the same kind of inhibitions and boundaries. We just gradually became more and more concerned. Eventually, doctors diagnosed Peggy with FTD, frontotemporal dementia. An MRI revealed her frontal lobe had shrunk, and there were holes throughout her brain. She'll do nothing but get worse. Another professional said, the best thing you can do is pray she dies quickly. That friction between the two of them during that time was very, very difficult for him. She would uh, run away. She'd keep me awake. I couldn't sleep. Finally, we uh, put her head in the memory ward, made her at home best we could when we left. When we left, and that door locked. That was awful. I remember feeling like I was losing my mom, but then as my dad's concerns about her grew, I remember feeling like I was losing him too. With a prognosis from the medical community of no hope of recovery, Peggy's family reached out to other relatives and friends for prayer. Prayers for her healing, prayers of comfort for my dad, prayers of comfort for us. The number of people praying for her because of the connections that my parents have had through their ministry through the years. And especially with, with social media today, word gets out. Why would we not expect a miracle? 
I was praying, Lord, help me accept this. And there was a day when I remember distinctly, God, do you take this as more than I can handle? That very day is the same day that Peggy, in the memory ward, was giving up to God. And from that moment on, she started to get better. When you kneel to pray. Since that day, not only did Dwayne notice a difference in Peggy's cognition, behavior, and motor skills, so did the doctors. So much so that by Christmas of that same year, the doctors and staff of the memory unit agreed that Peggy was well enough to be discharged and sent home. And she did so well, she started cooking. She could follow a recipe. She could play the piano. That terrible, far away look was gone from her eyes. Then the doctor said, I have treated hundreds of patients and it, nobody ever got better. This is a miracle. Though a CAT scan shows Peggy still has an abnormal brain, her condition has never regressed and she has never had to return to the memory unit. Her family says they owe it all to God and the power of prayer. And at first I thought, you know, I was scared I'd go back. But it's just good and maybe a little better all the time. That's more of a miracle that God is letting me function normally with an abnormal Hi, brain. Peggy. God is good and wonderful. I don't understand it all, but I think it's very evident that through men and women of faith and men, men and women of prayer, um, powerful things happen. We have had her back. We have had her the matriarch of our family again. How could we ever not thank God that we get to have our mom cooking? <laughs> we have so many friends and so many prayers, and most of the people were praying for her to be better, to be well. To have her back is a great blessing, a great, great blessing. of worship and great things will happen when we the church pray um, Dwayne is going to be preaching next Sunday we're going to have a mission Sunday and he's going to give an update on deaf missions during Bible school but he's going to come and preach next Sunday and it just by the the sovereignty and and uh, the Holy Spirit's working their story fits with today because great things happen when men and women of God pray there's so much that could be said about prayer. Um, I got to looking in the, in the Bible and just looked up pray, prayer, all these things at, in ways that you can say pray and found out that over two-thirds of the books of the Bible either mention the practice of prayer or it's prayer is demonstrated in those books that we pray. When men and women of God pray, great things happen. So over two-thirds of the Bible books specifically mention prayer. Only four of the New Testament books don't mention prayer. And I don't know why, but it's just like, it's interesting that prayer is such a huge topic. Uh, as we were talking in Dave's class this morning, it's like, do we ever feel like we pray enough? Probably not. So this morning, my goal is not to try to teach you a comprehensive thought on prayer, but it's like, let's look at one specific book and see what happens when the church prays. In the book of Acts, we started this morning with looking at Acts chapter 2, and where we saw that when the church gathered together, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Prayer was a habit. Prayer was a commitment that they made. There was a constancy to their prayer. They did it often. And you can see that throughout these early chapters of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we see this statement. 
made about when the apostles, after they had seen Jesus ascend into heaven, they went back to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 14, they all were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of James, and his brothers. They were continually united. They were devoted. Some translations will say they were devoted to prayer. Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. It was, a, it was a commitment they made. They were devoted to this practice. In chapter 6, you see when the church was growing, and, and there's a, the first little conflict within the church when there were widows being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And it was the apostles who said, choose men who can take care of this. And notice what it says um, that they said in verse 4, chapter 6, verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Great things happen when the church prays. And great things happen when we have a commitment, when we have a constancy to our prayers. Prayer is a discipline that I know not a one of us in this room probably feels like, man, I'm a great prayer. I know I can't claim that, but yet I still humble myself. I still take, go to God in prayer. I mentioned in our Sunday school class this morning, I think sometimes prayer is not so much that I'm taking things to God, but it's just my reminder that I don't, God's in control, I'm not. And so I go to him in prayer. Prayer is a commitment that the church made. And for us, as we gather in worship on a Sunday morning, prayer is a part of our worship service. We have a prayer list. No, we don't always pray through every one of those people or one of those situations that are listed in our prayer list and in life group we can have those opportunities bible school we can have those opportunities one-on-one -on -one, we can have those opportunities let us be a people let us be a church who prays and has a commitment to prayer but yet when i was reading through the book of acts i see that there were some things that specifically the church prayed for and so we're going to walk through just four different chapters, or three different chapters, and look at, in the book of Acts, and only in Acts this morning, what did the church pray for? Not when individuals gathered together, but when the church gathered together, what did they pray for? Let's start in the fourth chapter. In Acts chapter 4, you see that Peter and John are arrested. They face the Sanhedrin. And I love the story. They're faced there before the religious leaders. And this statement is made, or they boldly stand before them and say, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must, say, which we must be saved. And then these words. And when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. Uneducated, normal guys. But they had boldness. Why did they have boldness? You go down, starting verse 23. After they had been released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats, and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through all the name of your holy servant, Jesus. How is it that Peter and John had such great boldness before the Sanhedrin? An intimidating situation. Here's learned guys 
that are putting down the unlearned. The simple were standing before the complicated, and yet they had a boldness that said, we don't care what you say, we are gonna preach the name of Jesus. There is no other name given unto men amongst men who, by which we must be saved. They had a boldness, why? Because you can see that the church was praying for their boldness. And it wasn't just praying for the boldness of Peter or John. I think it's a prayer that all of us can pray. That God give us boldness in sharing the name of Jesus. Great things happen when the church prays. Great things will happen here in Griswold and the communities of the Griswold School District when we as a church begin to pray for boldness. That God will give us doors, open doors of opportunity. That God will allow us to speak the word of God clearly as we should. These are all prayers of Paul that he prayed. A Sunday school class that we are just wrapping up. That we pray for boldness. And again, I think the idea behind prayer is that it's like, it's not necessarily that it's because we need to take it to God. It's because then we need to recognize our need. I can be cowardly. I can sometimes be ashamed. I can be timid. But great things happen when the church, is, the church prays for boldness. And they said, and now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servant may speak your word with all boldness. So the church prayed for boldness. But we go on and see in this, in, this, in this book that the church prayed for another thing. In Acts, the sixth chapter, already mentioned that there was a constancy. The apostle says, you choose men amongst you that can do the serving, the waiting of the, on tables, that can meet this need that is within our church. And they said, that we will devote ourselves to the ministry of prayer and the word. But then we see that they prayed for their leaders. Verse, um, verse 6. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. When the church chose its leadership, the church then, the apostles, and then the church as well, prayed for its leaders. We see another example. When Paul became a great missionary for the church in Acts the 14th, Chapter verse 23, he, it says this. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. A second thing we see from this book, the book of Acts, is that great things happened when the church prayed, when the church prayed for its leaders. When its church prayed for its leaders. It's kind of almost seems self-assuming or whatever to say, would you pray for me? Would you pray for our elders? Would you pray for our ministry leaders? You pray for our ministries? Because see, great things will happen when we begin to pray for one another. We pray for our leaders and our leadership, that there is a unity in our leadership. In the book of Acts, the sixth chapter, you could have seen a great divide could have happened within the church. But when the church prayed for their leaders, there was unity. There was harmony. And you see that right after that it says, and the church grew. Great things happened when the church began to pray for its leaders. A third example in the script in the book of Acts, we see when the ch great things happened when the church prayed for one another. Chapter 12. Chapter 12. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church, and he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too during the festival of unleavened bread. And after the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently for him. Don't miss this. 
Peter is arrested. One of the other disciples has been murdered. And Peter is arrested. And everybody seems to know exactly what's going to happen the next day or as soon as Passover is over. Peter's in prison and he's going to soon die. But it didn't keep the church from praying for Peter. And I encourage you to read this chapter because there is a ton of humor in chapter 12. Because here's Peter in prison between two guards and in the middle of the night while he and the guards are sleeping, he feels a kick on his side and it's an angel of God who says, wake up, get dressed, and the chains fall off. And the whole time, Peter's thinking, I'm having the most incredible dream of my life. And it wasn't just enough that he was able to get up and the chains fall off, the door of the prison opens and then he walks out of the prison. Everybody's still snoozing. And he walks out of the prison, he walks out to the city street and the gates of the city begin to open and he's two blocks past the gates of the city and all of a sudden Peter goes this is not a dream this is the most incredible reality that anybody could ever dream of and Peter finds himself all of a sudden coming to reality that yes instead of facing impending death the next day he is a free man by what God did through an angel, through the Holy Spirit. It's a fun story. So then we see Peter then going to where the church is. More humor. Peter's knocking on the door. And a young lady comes and answers, comes to the door like, who's there? It's Peter. And she just screams, runs back to everybody and says, Peter's at the door. No, he's not. He's dr you're dreaming. It's got to be his ghost. And so Peter's like, no, it really is me. But notice what it says, what the church is doing. She, um, as soon as, verse 12, as soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. Where many had assembled and were praying. Catch what time of day it is. It's the middle of the night. And the church was praying for Peter. They were praying for one another. You know, there's not a magical time in which for us, the church, to pray. It's not just a, something we do on Sunday morning at 10, 15 on Sunday morning, sometime during this hour. All times of the day, any time of the day, we need to be a people who pray and we pray for one another the church was fervently praying for him you see early in chapter 12 and then when Peter is miraculously released from prison he goes to the place where he knew that they would be gathered and what were they doing they were praying for him great things happen when the church prays great things happen when the church prays for one another and so my encouragement to you this week take the bulletin and on the one f tab is a whole list of prayer requests would you pray for us let's pray for one another and it might be that in the middle of the night God wakes you up and says I need to pray for blank God sometimes does that he wakes us up in the middle of the night and we can't get to sleep until we have just said a simple prayer on behalf of one another. Let's pray for one another. Another avenue of prayer that we, we try to do, if you haven't signed up for our text caster thing, see Julie. Get us your, your, your cell phone number and we can send you a text because sometimes they come at the oddest time of the day and the church can stop wherever we are, whenever the time of day it is, and we can pray for one another. Just in this simple one book of the Bible, one of 45 books of the Bible that specifically mention prayer or the practice of prayer is modeled for us, we see great things happening when the church prayed. It's not something that we can just say, oh, that was history. It's something that we need to say, this is now. And great things will happen when we, the church, pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this element of worship, the element of prayer. It's probably more than we can sometimes comprehend all that is involved in prayer. But Father, help us not be a people that make it harder than it needs to be. But Father, when we just feel that prompting from you that we ought to pray, let us be a people who pray. Help us to pray for boldness. Help us to pray for one another. Help us to pray for our leadership. For Father, as a church, we want to see great things happen in our community, in the communities in which we live, and around the world. That your boldness, of, there is no other name given unto men by which we, may, we can be saved. The name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth. And Father, we lift the name of Jesus. And Father, help us be a church who boldly proclaims the name of Jesus. Help us to be a church who confidently lifts our leadership, ministry leaders and elders and ministers, one another in prayer. Father, because great things will happen when we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing a song. A song that just reminds us there's a teaching in the scripture that says that when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. And it is his name that we pray and great things happen.
it's a new month, so would you just take a seat real quick as we have some announcements that we want to just share with you. Announcements, announcements, announcements. Hey, people, pay attention. I got some stuff to tell you about. You know what's going on in the church this month? Well, pay attention, because I'm about to let you know. October 5th and 19th, 2019. Is fifth quarter. Make sure you sign up for goodies and sign up to help. Hey, I'm on a mission. Are you on a mission? Well, October 7th is Mission Sunday. Dwayne King's gonna be here for Deaf Missions. Be there or be square. Ooh, <laughs> and there's gonna be an all church potluck afterwards. You like chili? I like chili. <laughs> October 13th. Family game night and chili cook off. Well, on October 28th, there's a ministry leader's potluck from 11:30 till 1 p.m. I suppose that means you ministry leaders best be there. <laughs> Halloween! It's coming! I guess the church is having a Halloween carnival. 5 to 7 p.m. Might be worth checking out. Bleep, bleep, bleep. That's all, folks. <laughs> Curtis and Michelle, awesome job, right? <laughs> Get I know some of it was a little bit hard to understand, but the month of October, we have some really fun ministry opportunities. Check out your bulletin and uh, be a part of what's going on. <laughs> That's all, folks. Let's stand, and we're going to close with this. You and I are made to worship, and worship is not just something we have done here, but it's something we can continue on, and so let's leave. Before, after we're done singing this song, if you could help stack chairs. Uh, we're having a family visitation, a funeral visitation in here this afternoon. And if you could help set up some tables uh, in the Family Life Center as well, that'd be great help. So let's go. You and I are made to worship. You and I are called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. Day, and if you can help stack chairs, that'd be great.